Uh, what we're gonna share in this session is an approach for deploying flipped courses in Canvas. And just um, a quick uh, overview of what flipped courses are, that's where the lecture portion of a class that typically happens in person, perhaps in large tiered classroom lecture halls with PowerPoint slides, that is put online in some form, whether it be video or um, multimedia or text content. And then students consume that before coming to class, so they've built up all their background knowledge. And then in class, they use that in-person time with their peers and instructors to do hands-on problem solving and apply what they learned in the lecture online portion. So we're gonna share how we did that in Canvas. And the way that we did that in Canvas involves going to really great lengths, which you're going to see. And what we built, it worked well, and the faculty and students valued the experience. But we also want to be able to do this, and we plan to do this, in more courses um, with more students. And so we need to be able to make this happen in a more scalable way. So we wish at the same time that some of these features were built into the platform or that we can learn strategies from the folks here in this room um, in order to do this model in a way that's more supportable and more scalable. So we're here to share, we're here just as much to share what we did as to learn from you. So what did we do? Um, well, first about us, like Adam mentioned, we're coming from Stanford's Graduate School of Business. We only um, teach graduate students. So they're coming to us with a broad array of backgrounds. Some did um, undergraduate in business administration, but many did not. And they've also worked for at least a few years since their undergrad um, in a variety of different fields. So they're coming with all these different backgrounds and um, related or not to the content that they're learning in their MBA program. So here's what we did. We flipped two courses, three sections of those courses. Um, and this, this occurred uh, this winter. It um, took you know, a year process to, between like conversations starting and when we deployed the courses. And let you finish reading those. Okay, so there's what we did. Now we wanna show you what it looked like in Canvas. Alrighty, so uh, really just to reiterate sort of the, the goal, or part of the goal of uh, doing these flip courses was to really level set the students so that they're all coming into the classroom with a base level of knowledge. They, they've done their homework, uh, and then they, the faculty can actually tell that they've done that. Um, as you can see, um, we uh, really focused a lot on the, the visual design. Uh, we were with video and reading and um, some interactive elements all on the page. So um, fortunately, we've got a real Kraken design team, and, and they were kind of up to the challenge that, that our faculty set forth. Uh, you'll see a few of the interactives here that we use things like Kaltura, we developed some in-house LTIs, we use some publisher tools, we use an adaptive tool, uh, and then there's also these in-page questions, which are really, um, we feel like the heart of both what was really so powerful about this model, but also, um, you know, has presented some challenges. And so, um, you'll notice that this is really different from the typical instructional design tool, where you're more in a slide model where you read a little bit, you click next, you answer a question, you click next, maybe you watch a video, you click next, you answer another question. This is all on one long form page. Uh, and and why, why do we do this? So you'll, you'll see this is kind of breaking down an, an individual page. Um, there's some visual elements that sort of help the student parse that, so in some ways that takes the place of, of that slide design. Um, and we found we got um, really strong feedback from, from the students that they really appreciated this. They used it both as they were studying and in class. They would uh, just be able to parse through the information um, and, and really quickly find what they needed to do. Um, from the faculty perspective, um, they uh, really sort of pushed our team. They said, you know, we don't want our students to think 
that we're offloading any of our work, that they're doing all this stuff online and we're just being lazy and not lecturing. Um, you know, it's, it's MBAs, it's Stanford, so there's high expectations, so we really wanted to, to help meet that. Uh, and just to reiterate the student perspective, um, <laughs> what they found was they really liked being able to just hit control F and find the information that they need. Uh, you think about a slide by slide model, they couldn't have done that. So in class, if there was something that you know, they were getting cold called on, they could quickly find that information. Or if they're answering an in-page question, again, they just hit control F and they find that or scrub through the video and get to exactly what they need. And, and we found that it really helped their learning. So those in-page questions that you saw in the um, GIF of our page, I'm gonna show you another example of that in a minute, but that was a big part of our flipped classroom model. And so why was it so important? These two words, feedback and feed forward. So feedback is letting the students know how they're doing as they're going through content. Feed forward is letting the instructors know how the students are doing. And those in-page questions or those interspersed questions um, are a way to gather that feedback and feed forward. So remember that this portion of the class is happening online at home. So students are there and they don't have their instructor right there with them to let them know whether they're on track. Remember also that our students are bringing all these different types of backgrounds with them to bear as they're going through this content. Some have been working in finance, for example, and they already know this stuff cold, and some have never studied finance at all. Um, so th that background knowledge that they're bringing into the classroom influences how they're understanding the material that our faculty and instructional designers put together. So, Unless you check for understanding right there as they're going through the content, how, how else would you know whether the students understand, whether they're confused, or whether they think they get it, but they actually don't? Um, and how do the students themselves know how they're doing and whether they need to actually scroll back up that page and, and reread some of the content or whether they can breeze through and watch the next video on 2.5x speed. That's the point of the in-page questions. Um, so this feedback and feed forward are important parts of flipped learning, and that was a big part of our model. So we wanna share how we did this in Canvas. Okay, so I'm gonna show you another video and kind of talk you through this. This was in our finance course. Um, so students get to a Canvas page, and this one, they start off with a video. Um, in other cases, it might be an interactive or a piece of multimedia or text. And they're learning about the content through this, and right now they're studying about corporate bonds. So they're learning, and then, boom, they hit a question. And this question is directly related to what they just learned. So this is their chance to apply that and to check whether they're understanding it and they can move on to the next bit. Um, so we uh, gave them at the, you know, working with the faculty and instructional designers, um, a couple attempts for each question. So they could try it the first time and then if they got it wrong, they got feedback that they got it wrong and to try again. And so then they could try again and then they would get some additional feedback, so a little bit of explanation about the correct answer or um, the incorrect answer. Um, so now here is, this, this is not Canvas built-in functionality as you probably know. Um, so let me talk to you about how we did this. For those of you who are not interested in the technical stuff, tune out, and for those of you who are tuned in right now, um, so what these questions were, were Qualtrics surveys. Do any of your institutions use Qualtrics? Yeah, that's a lot. Um, so Qualtrics is a survey tool. A lot of uh, higher ed institutions use it. Um, it's really flexible, it can do a lot, it's really powerful, but it's a survey tool. And if you think about surveys and you think about checking for understanding, um, surveys, there's not usually a correct or an incorrect answer. 
There's not usually multiple attempts. Um, so it wasn't quite designed for the purpose that we were using it for, but it was flexible enough that we could get it into these pages and make it behave like we wanted it to. Um, so each question here is a Qualtrics survey, an individual survey. And in each survey, we programmed in validation and survey logic in order to check if what students were putting was correct and give them another attempt if not, um, or display correct or incorrect feedback or on multiple choice questions, feedback on each different type of choice that they could pick. We also embedded data into the, each survey so that we could um, use our university sign-on to identify who that student was. That allowed us to know who was answering what and what they put. Um, we had a custom CSS template in order to style these so that they would most kind of look like part of the Canvas page that you couldn't really tell you were in a different tool. Um, and we added custom JavaScript onto each Qualtrics question in order to override some of the behaviors that make more sense for a survey tool, um, but not as a checking for understanding tool. There's even more that we did with Qualtrics that you're gonna hear about in a minute um, as we talk about feed forward. So John, go ahead and tell us about feed forward. Alrighty, so in the course of this, Pamela unlocked the guru status badge for Qualtrics, so <laughs> she's awesome. <laughs> um, so you're probably wondering why on earth put all that work into making those crazy Qualtrics surveys why, you, you know, you could just do a little maybe JavaScript thing and just um, have the, a little quick self-assessment. You know, we've seen a few tools like that. And really, it's feed forward that's the, in, the, the answer. Our faculty let us know that, that they wanted this data, that they would um, alter the way that they're teaching, that the way they would alter the way that they maybe go into a, an office hours one-on-one -on -one interaction with the students. So really, um, it's this kind of counterbalance between the feedback that the students would get and the feed forward that the, the data would provide the instructors that, that we found so, uh, so powerful. However, yeah? Is it an LTI integration? It is not. It's just pure single sign-on, shibboleth, or SAML. Um, and we, we, we sort of wish it was, we'll, but we'll get there at, at some point. Um, sort of one thing that went with this, especially um, on the point of the instructor coming into class, this is actually really a pretty big paradigm shift for a lot of instructors. You know, usually, I remember this when I was teaching, like you kind of have your canned spiel, you go in and you do that. With this data, you need to be ready to be flexible. Maybe you're gonna cover something a lot in a lot more detail that you didn't know students have big misconceptions about. And other parts that you think are really cool and important, maybe they get it and you can just move on. Um, and again, also individual meetings. We found that the, the faculty really appreciated it's business school, there's cold calling, so you know, being able to look at which student you know, maybe either did really well or maybe struggled at a point to try to help them through, through some of that. Um, so to get into a little bit more of the technical details, so again, you can click off if this isn't your thing. Um, each one of these sur surveys is actually, or questions, excuse me, is an individual Qualtrics survey. Um, so all, all of the surveys had to be tagged so that we knew what was what and you know, all the multiple attempts um, set up. And all of that data, um, our data analysts mapped over to Salesforce, which has a nice integration with Qualtrics and then also works well with Tableau, which is the tool that, as you can see, we use for our visualizations. Um, this is a place where we found that the faculty couldn't be as flexible as they'd like because it took so much time to actually map all these different data fields. Really, these questions had to be set far in advance so that everything could be ready to go. You're probably hearing why we're saying this is gonna be difficult to scale up and we, we wanna try some different approaches for our next time. Um, so just to take a look at um, Tableau, this is an example of one of the, the dashboards um, where you can see sort of for a class, um, See, it says session two, here's all the different um, questions, uh, and you can see what percentage of students got things correct or incorrect. So it really stands out like this early stuff, they get it, this later stuff, maybe not. And then again, uh, this is something we really heard that the faculty appreciated was the ability to drill down at the student level. You're not seeing student names here, we cut those out, but for each session, how well are they doing? And if, if you click this, then you get the, level, the next level of questions. 
And again, that next level of are they getting it right on the first attempt, the second attempt, really being able to get to exactly um, the data that they want. Tableau is such a powerful tool for that that we knew it would be a good fit for us. It's a really powerful tool, but at the same time, we didn't quite get to the point where, you know, it's sort of the dream, like let's bring everything together. So I mentioned before um, we use Qualtrics at our institution. Um, so this is an example of a Qualtrics dashboard. Kaltura. Oh, Cal Kaltura, sorry. <laughs> Thank too you. Too many tools. I know, too many tools. We'll, we'll get back to that. Um, this was an ID, so it wasn't actually a student, but you can see it gives data on, you know, how much have they watched, which video, um, things like that. So. This is one of the friction points that we'll get to that, you know, it's having multiple data sources really um, makes the instructors not want to go check everything out in that way. All right. Yeah. Oops. Oh, ahead. yeah. So <laughs> we want to we wanna stop talking for a bit and have you guys chat with each other about how you're using feedback and feed forward in your courses and your work or how you're thinking about using feedback and feed forward after the new products and tools that you've seen at InstructureCon, um, and then we're gonna circle back to those. So take a few minutes, talk to the people around you, and discuss feedback and feed forward. Yeah, sure. All right, wrap up those conversations. Take another few seconds. It's great to hear so much conversation. Oh yeah. Might have to break off the teacher voice. I know. <laughs> All right. We'll get back to it. How does it go? Is three claps? Uh, yeah. One, two, three, eyes on me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, right, right. That was, back. that was from the K-12 yeah. days. Okay. Yep. Hang on to those ideas because we are going to have some open discussion afterwards. And it sounded like there were a lot of good ideas in here. I'm hoping that we can improve on our approach. So um, hang on to what you were just talking about. OK. So why do we have this up here? Um, I wanted to tell you a little bit about a tradition at Stanford. It's called the primal scream. So there's something called dead week. It happens at the, at the end of classes. There's this week of no classes, and there's no anything, and that, that is used as a time for students to study feverishly before finals the following week. And um, on the Sunday of that dead week, after they've been studying all week and they're gearing up for finals at midnight, they scream from their dorms as loud as they can. And it's a tradition of stress alleviation for students. So that is basically the exact opposite of what we were trying to do with our interspersed questions on Canvas pages. Checking for understanding as students go through content is not a midterm or final exam. Um, those are high stakes, summative assessments, and they're designed to capture how students performed at the end of instruction. So that brings us to our problem. Um, the Canvas tools that were available at the time that we were building these courses are designed for summative assessments that happen at the end of a lesson or a module. So if you think about the quiz tool, it's labeled as a quiz. That's a term that has higher stakes than what we were trying to do with these checks for understanding. Um, if you think about the quiz tool, students go through like 10 questions or 20 questions, and they don't see how they did on all of them until the end when, it's, when they've answered everything. Um, and so that's why we used the Qualtrics tool and, and did everything with that um, in order to provide this lower stakes, check how you're doing, get feedback, give feed forward experience. Um, and it's also why we want to you know, improve on that approach through built-in tools that support this model. So where are we with this model? What's next for us? All righty, so some of the iterations and improvements that um, we're at least thinking of. Uh, first of all, we found with the, that first really just visually appealing page, it's, it's really prone to breaking. So we're looking at some tools to help um, with the design of that so that faculty, when they go in and make that little tweak, they don't break it and then they have to call a designer and we roll back the changes and um, we, we need, think we can improve on that. 
Um, obviously, all that heavy lifting um, in terms of setting up the Qualtrics questions, you know, with all the tagging and things like that, um, and then again the analysis, uh, we really feel like we can we can improve on that. Um, and we also heard pretty loud and clear um, some feedback from the students about that experience with Qualtrics. Like, in some ways it was good, but in other ways it was bad. Sometimes if they're single sign-on timed out, but they were still signed into Canvas, they'd see a login screen or 10 if there were 10 questions on the page. Um, and, and then also that feedback that they got you know, right away the next time they come back, um, just because of how Qualtrics works, that feedback is gone. And, and we really, again, because that feedback is so important, we really want to try to maintain that for them. Uh, also another thing that may be unique to business schools, um, there's a lot of desire to reuse the content. So by being so complex, it's difficult to scale up, but it's also difficult to transport to other audiences. And that's something that, that we're hoping to do. And then finally, uh, we use a lot of integrations with, with the, this. Um, the ones we mentioned, and, and probably a few more, some publisher tools. And we really found ourselves in that classic place where you need learning analytics. You need to follow the standards. So that's sort of the, the next step that we're starting to look at is how can we bring all this data together, both for that um, teaching dashboard that instructors use as the course was being run, but then we also tried to pull all this data together after the course is run to really try to validate you know, what, what was a success, what else needs improving. Um, and again, both of those things could be served well by um, using learning analytics. Another saying that we have at the GSB from one of our uh, uh, professors is that feedback is a gift. So um, it just seems really apt that, that this is sort of you know, giving the gift of feedback to uh, students and, and to us. Um, but then we're also you know, hoping to get some feedback from you all. You know, what, what do you think might work for you? What questions do you have? Uh, what ways can we work together and utilize the Canvas community, which is, is just a super thing that um, you know, we, we don't feel like this is necessarily the one answer, but you know, together we can all find a, a way to, to bring some of these um, elements of this model to, to other areas. All right, so with that, we are going to leave our contact up on the um, projector and take it open to questions, suggestions. What do you got? Yes, in the back. Hi. Um, I, oh, thank you. Hey, um, so thanks. Your presentation's awesome. I, I like what you've been doing. Um, so just, I guess it's more of a, a question and maybe a, an, an idea. So I see you were using the Qualtrics to integrate with the class. Um, so the first thing that popped to my mind was why not use a, um, a SCORM compliant authoring tool to throw those knowledge checks in there so that your data feeds into uh, Canvas as opposed to a third party site. Um, and then the other thing is like if you're looking uh, to throw in the knowledge checks and you're showing them video, uh, you might be able to leverage a tool like PlayPosit where you're, they're watching the video and it's gonna pose questions to them as they're watching. And then you could, if you want to go out to a third party site, maybe that's something that you could take advantage of. Thanks. Awesome. Yeah, we heard some other suggestions about those um, interactive video tools um, that are out there, and we're definitely looking at those. We had some specific needs about question types, like a lot of numeric questions that can be answered with a range of accuracy and all that kind of stuff. So that can be hard to find out there. Um, we do see that Canvas uh, Quizzes Next has that, as well as formulas coming, so we're really excited about that. But we are also looking at the interactive video and um, the SCORM authoring, uh, authoring tool approach as well for potential round two. Good suggestions. Others? I see one, was there? Way back there, or? All right, you next, you first, you next. I was looking for where the microphone is, but. All right, let's go in the back and I'll repeat your question. Sure, okay, we are putting the slide back up with the long form page. Yeah, so this is all actually a Canvas page that scrolls and scrolls and has everything in it for that class. This is actually one page, but our slide wasn't long enough, so it would be like scroll down to here, and then scroll to here, and then scroll. Yeah. 
the question was, are you asking, was it static images or? Uh, we had everything. So we had static images, we had video, we had interactive tools, um, we had simulations, we had articles to read, websites linked, all of that. Um, the pages, how long were they? It just depended week to week. Um, some classes used uh, one page for that. One page was for each class session. Um, and so it was just however long that they needed it to be. And this was something that we were a little bit, you know, skeptical about at first, too. Like, is this really the way, is this necessary? But the students did really like it for the, for the reason that we talked about of having everything in one place and being able to search and navigate it. Question so back? I have oh, okay. a yes. quick question, kind of Great. back to the video quizzing. I, since you're a Cal Kaltura customer, um, have, did you guys look at the Calturing, Kaltura quizzing or Camtasia? And if so, how was your experience with that? Yeah, sure. Um, basically, at this point, our understanding is it's just multiple choice. And um, we've talked with our faculty a lot about sort of the, the types of questions, the way that they want to check student understanding in it. Um, because the two classes were finance and, and data, really the, the math, the need for math was pretty high. So we've looked at some other tools that might plug into Kaltura and things like that for that, but at least, you know, again, this was, you know, over a year ago that we were getting ready to launch this. It wasn't there yet. Thanks. I'm curious more about the format of the flipped classroom and to what extent did the students complete the work before they went into the classroom? And how did you use the data? Like, were you accessing the data and feeding that back either to the faculty or the students? And yeah. Yeah, great question. And actually, it's, it's kind of interesting because it differed by class. Um, so in the data class, which is a little bit more applied, um, they met in a computer lab. Um, the faculty really used the data heavily to, to sort of influence how they were teaching. They would kind of really do that, that prototypical thing that you want the faculty to do, to do when they're um, flipping their class and sort of alter their, their methods. Um, in the other class, it, um, there was some timing issues. There was a lot more content than there was. It's also a little bit less practical. So there, we found that the students struggled to get through it. They felt like it was uh, a pretty large time investment. So. Um, that's one of the things that we're kind of taking back for the next iteration is sort of right-sizing it, seeing if maybe we can take elements of that class to fit into other classes. Um, but it's your question spot on. I'll add on that just one yeah. thing. Um, one thing to add on that was um, with that teacher dashboard that we showed, um, that was a really important piece in for accountability purposes for the students as well. So. Not only did the students know how they were doing from the feedback that they saw, and not only did the teachers know how the students were doing from the dashboard, but the students knew that the teachers knew how they were doing because they had that dashboard and then the instructors would enter that into a assignment in Canvas. And so each week they would see like my participation score and my accuracy score. Yes, question in the front. assessments in a graduate level program? Hmm. I think they were on board with that. Nothing is coming to mind um, about challenges with this. I mean, they had a lot of specific requirements that they wanted for these questions. Um, so that was more what we had was like, you know, all the different it has to have this many attempts, or it has to validate answers in this way, and you have to give this type of feedback and things like that. But they were bought into that, um, the value of formative assessment. So that's a good point that that, that hel was helpful. Question, yes. Yeah, um, that, so our instructional designers are gonna be super jealous of this, because uh, it's a really cool course and idea. I'm curious about how, um, did the faculty come approach you with this idea? Who, how did this start? Because uh, I would love to be able to approach someone at, at our institution about this. 
it, it was a little more, I'd say, sort of a conversation between some of the campus leadership and the faculty. Um, the, I think, you know, as sort of we, the instructional designers started talking with the faculty and really getting in deeper on sort of what made them passionate about teaching, then they kind of found that mutual interest, but at least the first spark was, was not quite from the faculty. Good question. We'll be hanging out, so if, if you have more questions or want a business card, we'd be glad to chat with you about um, information you want or ideas that you might have. Thanks again.